The body is extraordinary. It's an engineering marvel, accomplishing billions of feats in the beat of a heart. Its complexity is behind the scenes while we dance, eat, and love, dream, laugh, and explore. But it's also human. At times, it grows, learns, and heals. Other times, it weakens, wears, and sometimes it fails. When it does, Extraordinary doesn't just deserve Extraordinary, it demands it. Not tomorrow, but today. Groundbreaking, awe-inspiring, life-restoring feats of engineering to strengthen, lengthen, and save lives while also working in brilliant symphony with everything, everything that is already extraordinary about the human body. Medtronic, engineering the extraordinary. Healthcare is deeply personal, from welcoming a newborn baby to caring for an aging parent. Our most precious, most emotional and trying moments are directly tied to healthcare. Millions of people around the globe continue to suffer the effects of complex and challenging conditions. Life's ordinary moments are stolen each day. A walk to the local market, watching a grandchild score their first goal, or a conversation over coffee, for many, these events are more than an arm's reach away. For some, they're replaced with the burden of managing multiple insulin injections. For others, it's hours transporting loved ones to and from appointments. And in the worst scenarios, ordinary life is consumed by disease that makes even picking up a glass of water an impossible task. And not only does the burden of disease bring great personal cost, there are great societal costs as well. Spending is going up, not down. People are going into hospitals sicker than ever. Comorbid conditions affect people of color at unacceptable rates. We've become too dependent on prescription medication. And all of this is further compounded by issues of access. Healthcare is in reality sick. We cannot tolerate this any longer. We have a wealth of technology at our fingertips. We must harness this to address the challenges of today. Discover conditions earlier, treat them earlier, reduce disparities in care, and ensure that there is equal access to care for all. Society demands it and deserves it. And we must move with urgency. The world can't wait for someday. We need to act today, especially in light of some disturbing trends. The pandemic has been a wake-up call, demonstrating how tightly health and wealth are connected. As costs have skyrocketed, Governments are facing a looming bill. And against the backdrop of the pandemic, chronic disease has taken a back seat. Chronic diseases kill 41 million people each year. That represents nearly three quarters of all deaths globally. Cardiovascular diseases, cancers, respiratory diseases, and diabetes make up 80% of all chronic disease deaths. And many of these are preventable, or at least treatable when caught early which is what really makes these numbers appalling. Our progress is slowing down. While people are living longer lives, they're living more years in poorer health. The rise in chronic disease in both developed and developing countries represents a slow-moving disaster. The crisis of chronic disease may not make daily headlines or be as in our face as a pandemic, but it's real and it's scary to consider. As a society, we could be stalling out in our fight against complex health challenges. To counter these trends, we need to redefine what and how healthcare can deliver. We need to set and achieve higher standards. This requires far-reaching vision and pace-setting partnerships. It requires companies like Medtronic to rethink our potential, to rethink the speed and scale at which we can serve the world. As a leader in healthcare technology, our products and services have improved and continue to improve the lives of millions of people every day. But we must do more. We can help more people in more meaningful ways more quickly. While some are benefiting, too many are not. This is our urgent responsibility. And I'm inspired by what's possible, but what hasn't yet achieved. Imagine a world where lung cancer can be identified, diagnosed, and treated in a single 
minimally invasive event. A world where, regardless of where you live, you have access to the best surgeon for your case, and they can perform it from half a world away. A world where patients living with diabetes have care that is predictive and personalized. A world where a tiny implanted monitor tells your doctor you need to be seen before you even know it. A world where there is equal access to care for all. And we're putting a stake in the ground. Medtronic will no longer be known as just a medical device company. We're going beyond devices to help technology serve more people in more ways than ever before. Driven by this bold ambition, we're making sure the structure of our businesses matches our goal. We've evolved our operating model to get closer to our customers and to eliminate barriers to moving with speed. We've changed our culture to make bold moves and double down on our commitment to quality and our commitment to our results. And to meet the needs of a changing world, we're pushing innovation even further in four ways. The human body is the most complex operating system on the planet. Designing solutions to heal it when it breaks not only requires engineering determination, but a deep understanding of the human anatomy. We're committed to creating life-transforming innovation, not just incremental innovation. When our co-founder, Obakin, developed the first battery-powered pacemaker in the late 1950s, it was revolutionary. And today, technology can perform medical marvels we never imagined. Whether it's someone living with Parkinson's who can finally hold their morning coffee with a steady hand, or the relief from chronic pain someone needs to play with their children. Groundbreaking technologies expand what's possible. But technology alone can't solve the challenges we face today. Healthcare is personal, so we must put people first. We're committed to delivering the best possible experiences for every patient, physician, and caregiver we serve. Hospitals are struggling with capacity. Clinicians are overwhelmed. At the same time, patients expect more from their care. They expect and they deserve experiences that help them recover faster, return home more quickly. Whether it's the world's smallest pacemaker or a tiny capsule that lets doctors see inside your digestive tract, minimally invasive approaches result in a speedier recovery, less risk of infection, and less time in the hospital. Putting people first means health systems can be more efficient and patients can get back to doing what they love most. And putting people first is a commitment that extends to our global team of more than 95,000 passionate workers. We're creating an inclusive, diverse culture of belonging. Beyond being the right thing to do, we know it's good for business and will help us continue to deliver the life-transforming technologies patients deserve. Combating the world's most complex healthcare challenges also requires reaching millions more patients. Not just every year, but every day. We're committed to using data and AI to both accelerate and achieve new scale, making healthcare more predictive and personal. The pace of technology innovation is accelerating. Artificial intelligence is becoming pervasive in our daily lives, from smartphones to smart homes, and it demands that healthcare keep pace. Driven by advancements in computational power, we're seeing communication networks, sensors, robotics, virtual reality, and AI exponentially improving. For example, imagine a diabetes insulin pump that learns your patterns and gives you personalized guidance to better manage your insulin. The potential also goes beyond improving performance of individual devices. There is a vast opportunity to improve medical care overall. With the advent of 5G, we can transport data faster, like millions of images and videos from surgeries around the world to train other physicians. And let me be clear, caring for the health of patients also means caring for their health data. As data is used to unlock better outcomes and brighter futures, we will be fervent protectors of the data entrusted to us. Perhaps the greatest thing holding back our global promise is access to healthcare. To make healthcare work for all, we have to democratize it. We have to make it more accessible. Like the internet, healthcare is everywhere, but not everyone has access. 
In emerging markets, lack of infrastructure, awareness, and training are a real challenge. But even in the U.S., we've seen great disparities. Access to care shouldn't be a luxury based on your location in the world or the color of your skin. We're committed to expanding healthcare access and to delivering positive outcomes that go far beyond our products. Look, it's clear, governments alone cannot meet the needs of their citizens. And there are high expectations for businesses to step in and fill the void. Our commitment to patient safety and quality will continue to receive our unrelenting focus. But improving the health of our world extends to social and economic outcomes as well. This includes efforts like protecting the planet by minimizing our carbon footprint and supporting the needs of our local communities. Tackling the biggest healthcare challenges won't be easy. Then again, the things worth fighting for never are. Right now, the world needs the power of grit, determination, and urgency. Innovation and then some. We all need to demonstrate the mindset of an engineer. So we're tapping into our problem-solving legacy inspired by our engineering co-founder. After all, in its modern interpretation, we're all engineers. Regardless of our professional titles, every one of us experiments, creates, builds, and improves. We're also recommitting ourselves to why we innovate. Our mission holds us to extraordinary expectations across both what we do and how we do it. The first five words echo in my mind every day, to contribute to human welfare. We're confident in our ability to achieve our bold ambition, to become the global leader in healthcare technology, because we're compelled to share many more stories like this one. I was really, really depressed. I needed assistance for everything. It was very depressing to see her just really break down. I was around 17 years old and I took the electric stairs and fell back. I had a gigantic bruise on my back. Really her goals were simple. She wanted to care for herself, do her household work, do her art, which is her passion, and most importantly, play with and care for her grandson. I did physical therapy and medication, but then in 2020, that's when things got really bad. And they were just treating the pain for a short time. So then I had to see another doctor and another doctor. And at some point I was just like, okay, I think I'm gonna have to take medication forever because I didn't feel a complete recovery. That's not really ideal, you know, to be constantly taking, you know, pain medications every, every single day. Arlene and I met about a year ago now when she came in for an evaluation of her chronic low back pain. I discussed various different treatment options that were available to her, including DTM spinal cord stimulation. We've tried everything. So when she said, I'm getting another procedure for my back, I was like, oh, wow. I'm scared because usually after procedures, she gets worse, you know, things don't get better. After the surgical implant was done, she remains at 70% relieved. She's having more fun than ever with her grandson and she's back to doing her art. She's got a, a skip in her step. She can do what she was doing before. She's now back to herself. She's got a better outlook on life and, and she comes every day with, with happiness on her face. It felt like a weight lifted off my shoulders. And when you see your mom, you know, flourish and her smiling again, it just felt like I could take a deep breath and I just could breathe again and I could just be. I remember my son told me one time, oh my God, mom, I'm so happy that you are happy. They saw the change and I seen it too. The fact that I can do household chores, clean the kitchen, mop, that really makes a difference and it made me feel you're back again, you're getting younger. <laughs> to see her go from when she walked in and just visibly defeated to having hope and playing with her grandson and doing her art again, it makes me feel great. I am good. It's like, like a new chance in life.
Our ambition is bold indeed, with the expectation of extraordinary results. It's been said that the only way to predict the future is to create it. The world needs leaders right now to deliver on the extraordinary future we all know is possible. We're engineering the extraordinary at Medtronic, and I hope you'll join us. Wow, thanks Jeff for that inspiring message. It was great to see. Uh, and thanks for sitting down with us today for a little while. And welcome to our audience. Uh, we're very excited to be with you today to spend a little time really digging a little deeper into our bold ambition, uh, which we're going to talk about today with Jeff and going to take some questions from the audience as well. So one thing to encourage you uh, while we're speaking today, be sure to put your questions into the chat. We're going to do this real time uh, in terms of maximizing our opportunity uh, for this time. Uh, one thing I think in terms of setting this discussion up, you saw that re referenced a little bit in the bold ambition video is you know, we're excited about you know, evolving our brand and really taking advantage of some unique opportunities that exist for Medtronic in the marketplace, but also I think in reflection to some major seismic changes that are happening across healthcare. And so we're gonna do some work to dig into what that means for Medtronic and also kind of society at large. So let's kick this off, Jeff, with a couple of questions. One in particular, maybe given that last point, given all the things going on in the world today, uh, why this brand shift today? Why this focus on this bold new ambition for Medtronic? Well, that's a, that's a good question to start it off with. Uh, look, I, I think a couple of things I'd say. I'd say first, uh, you know, health now more than ever, coming out of this awful pandemic, and we're not out of it totally yet, but we do see light. Um, you know, healthcare is forefront in everybody's mind. And uh, the importance of technology as a part of healthcare is, uh, is also is also there. And, and uh, you combine that with all this innovation that's going on, Right, not just obviously in biotech and pharma, the vaccine is a, is, a, is a miracle, right? But also broader than that, in in our world, in the med tech world, you've got you know miniaturization and computing power, robotics. I, the list goes on. So you combine healthcare is forefront of everybody's mind. They understand the importance of technology, a lot of innovation, and then why Medtronic? We're a leader in this space. We're the world's largest medical device company. Um, we've got the a, a wonderful pipeline. If not us, if we're not going to take a leadership role here, then, then who? And so you combine it all together and, and, and that's why uh, we're doing this now. Yeah, that's great. You know, one of the things we did in anticipation of this conversation is did a, a poll of um, consumers, you know, including our employees and uh, globally asked about what people perceive to be some of the most significant challenges today in healthcare and perhaps unsurprising to you, cost was one of the things that came back most consistently um, from the vantage point of what people think we need to focus on. So what's your view of kind of Medtronic and the opportunity for us to look at healthcare costs and the role we can play, should play in that challenge? Well, sure, look, I, I think technology is a, a, a solution to the, the cost problem. Obviously, there is a big cost problem. We spend a lot of money on healthcare and, and uh, some of these technology advances can play a big role, like for example, uh, I talked about just a second ago, miniaturization of technology, like take a simple thing like a pacemaker. Now with uh, leadless pacemakers, you know, historically you have a, a surgical procedure with a pacemaker. Now it can be without surgery inserted with a catheter and, and you're out the same day and lower complications. And so we're, we're making it, you know, less costly because you're lowering the complications all due to, to technology. Another uh, role uh, that, that uh, technology can play in lowering costs is is just allowing for you know treatment earlier, uh, or navigating patients to the right place. So, for example, uh, you know sensor technology. There's all kinds of sensor technology that are wearables, plus just under the skin that can monitor a patient's condition, and before it escalates to a problem, we can uh, notify that patient and/or their caregiver to to go see the doctor and help navigate them to the right place because we know what's going on. So, you know you're you're using technology. Uh, to just lower the cost of even acute care uh, and then uh, uh, treat people earlier and avoid escalation. And, and the list goes on, but technology is, is a key uh, to lowering costs. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing to think about, uh, again, the way you've started to talk about some of the innovations happening at Medtronic. And so we'll dig a little deeper into that uh, as we continue to talk. But one other question for those of us who follow you on social media, LinkedIn and otherwise, you were in Italy last week with the G20, B20. And so obviously a lot of interesting conversations you were a part of there. But what were perhaps some of your bigger takeaways from your week uh, with the G20, B20? Well, first of all, it was a great week. It was it was fun to be as my first trip overseas since being CEO because uh, of COVID, and 
uh, the world is starting to open up. So it was great to see, you know, government officials and customers and employees and and the and the you know specifically to your question, the the B20 uh, is is part of um, is organized around the G20. And the G20 is going to be in Italy here soon, and the B20 is a platform for businesses to communicate uh, their thoughts uh, to to uh, to the government, the top governments of the world, and. And uh, I was part of a life sciences team, and uh, you know we we've been working over the last year to kind of our poli you know, from a life sciences perspective, what are our policy recommendations? And I'd say the key theme, there's a couple, but the one I'd highlight here is is goes back to my prior point is is tech the role of technology in healthcare and solving the problems of 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 co better outcomes, uh, better access, and lowering costs at the same time. And technology plays a big role, and getting governments. Uh, around the world to think about uh, technology, um, uh, healthcare as a strategic investment versus a cost, and also just you know educating them on all the analysis that's been done that shows you know that a dollar invested in healthcare uh, is at least a dollar. Most studies would show two to four dollars of GDP. So it's it's an economic driver, and to get them in that mindset. Yeah. Okay. Great question. Okay, so we're going to go to some of the live questions coming in in the chat. So again, one encouragement, keep sending them in. Uh, we're going to try and get to as many as we can here. But uh, Jeff, to kick things off a little bit, um, first question here from Shauna. A challenge in many parts of the world is a lack of skilled clinicians. We hear about this a lot. Uh, you can have all the advanced technology in the world, but without people who can diagnose, treat, and be accessible to the community, few patients will benefit. What is technology's role in addressing this critical issue of access? Well, look, it is you know access is a big issue, and, you, and especially when you think about the the developing world, right. where you've got most of the world's population, billions of people. It takes a lot of physicians and frontline healthcare workers to take care of them, and if it, in the training model that we've done in in developed world of, of or like the United States or Europe, whatever of of medical school, and then. A residency and then a fellowship. We just don't have that. That's not going to work if you're going to, in a, in a timely fashion, provide advanced health care to the billions of people in, in developing world. So that don't have access to health care today. But so technology plays a, a big role in that. Yep. You know, first of all, you know, we're training physicians uh, much differently now, you know, virtually uh, using technology. That's one key thing. Also, but the technology takes some of the burden off of the physician. Think about surgical robotics, for example. It is um, a, a great analogy I like to think about is we're moving towards, it's like we're moving towards a self-driving car. We're moving, technology is allowing us to move towards a self-driving robot um, and that can actually perform the surgically in an automated way and take the burden off of a physician. So in a sense, you're getting world-class, it's democratizing uh, healthcare. You're getting world-class capabilities delivered uh, all over the world, even if there isn't one of those skilled physicians there to do that procedure. Sure. Interesting. You mentioned robotics. That's unbelievably exciting to a lot of people, many of us. So one question here, though, as a follow-up on that one in particular, was what technology are you most excited about when you think about the future uh, for Medtronic and healthcare? Well, that's a, that's a tough one because there's yeah. a lot. I mean, the, you know, we, we've talked about miniaturization and how that, you know, kind of re redefines what you can do with procedurally. We've talked about, you've got robotics. And, and, and robotics is a big one. I, I think it's a toss-up between robotics because you're, you're just, you're, you're, we talked about the, how it mitigates um, lack of surgeons and skills around the world. But it also, robots can do things that, that, that maybe the human hand can't. Uh, and it's not just about the robotic arm, it's about all the other technologies that surrounds that robot, navigate, imaging equipment, navigation, so that uh, it's just a much more um, sophisticated approach and you're, we're getting you know, better outcomes and, and, and uh, lower length, uh, shorter length of stay. So robotics is a big one. The other one though, is, is, which overlaps with robotics, is data. And the amount of data that we're now getting because all these the devices and apps and are connected you know to the cloud where we can you know use artificial intelligence and machine learning um, to identify patterns and and redefine what's possible with healthcare and we're seeing things like AI um, you know data and the in the appropriate use of AI um, you know create all kinds of access opportunities like you know one example I give is is right now in, in the UK with uh, this huge waiting list 
uh, caused by COVID of, of, of right. colon cancer screenings, you know, colonoscopies. You know, we've now, you know, using a pill, right, uh, to replace the traditional colonoscopy procedure, which, you know, as we yes. know, is not the most pleasant yes. experience. And it's creating a whole lot of access. Uh, and, and the UK is using this, the NHS and the UK is using this to move through their waiting list. So AI is a big one, and data and AI is a big one in robotics. Sure. Okay. Another great question that is another jump off on that last one as well is around how you see Medtronic's relationship with tech giants like Apple and Google changing or evolving in the future? Well, it, it is evolving and it, we are spending a lot more time uh, working and partnering with, with the, the tech companies like the ones you've listed, learning from them, um, partnering with them, and uh, I think we're very complimentary. You know, at, at some point, you know, it remains to be seen, um, are we going to be ultimately be tight partners? Are we going to be competitors, um, you know, or, or is it a vendor relationship? I, I tend to think it's going to be a little bit of uh, partnering and maybe some competition, healthy competition. At the end of the day, um, this is only going to benefit patients uh, and lower costs in health care. And um, so I, I, I think uh, we're learning from them. They're certainly learning from us as well. And I think it's going to be a little bit of both, a little bit of partnership. And look, you may see some of the tech companies uh, ultimately, on, on, at least on the fringe of what we do, compete with us. Yeah. Okay. Another question in here, in your view, given, again, the focus on the bold ambition and this broader healthcare and technology opportunity, what are some roadblocks from your vantage point as CEO that are top of mind for you in terms of this journey? Well, look, I'd start with, you know, at Medtronic, we're blessed with a lot of good things. I mean, we've got this wonderful mission that keeps us focused on patient outcomes. We've got a, uh, an unbelievable uh, scientific and clinical underpinnings. You know, we've, we're blessed with a, with a nice uh, balance sheet so we can have the ability to invest. Uh, so I think, you know, there's more tailwinds than there are headwinds, but there are headwinds. There are obstacles. I think, you know, the big one is making sure we have the right people uh, with the right mindset. I mean, uh, to innovation, we're all about innovation, and the whole, you know, our whole, you know, tagline here, you know, engineering the extraordinary, it's all about innovation, and innovation uh, is still a people game, and we need the best people, and uh, it's a technology-driven world, and so we're competing for those people, so we need to make sure we have these, the, the right people, uh, that's one, and then the other is the right mindset. We talked about, you know, moving away from incremental thinking to thinking bigger and bolder, that's about part of this, this, this branding and defining who the company is and really putting a stake in the ground. Uh, so we're gonna have continued meaningful you know, iteration of our, our therapies, but we also are gonna be going after, and you're seeing that, bigger, more disruptive, market-creating uh, innovations like robotics, um, like a new uh, hypertension therapy, a breakthrough hypertension therapy that doesn't involve uh, you know, drugs, it's a, it's a catheter-based therapy. Uh, these are things that uh, create huge markets, but most importantly, uh, treat millions of patients. Sure. And so thinking bigger. So right. the right people and the right mindset. Right. Okay. Super. Another question in here from Lynn. Okay. Uh, Medtronic has been working to solve healthcare disparities. What is your point of view on this space and what excites you most about Medtronic in addressing disparities? Well, first of all, we've been working on this, you know, um, for quite a, you know, for at least a decade I've been here and we've started, you know, started companies even, uh, you know, in developing countries focused exclusively on delivering high quality care at the, at the, you know, at the bottom of the pyramid here. And we've made a lot of progress and it continues to evolve. So I'm excited about our progress. We're learning how to apply technology in, in creative ways to get meaningful outcomes in a low resource environment. And we've, we've, we've made a lot of progress. I think what I'm most excited about is that um, more and more stakeholders in healthcare are getting involved. We can't go to a, uh, a hospital visit uh, and visit with uh, some of our hospital partners without them bringing this up, how they want to partner with us. So hospitals, governments, so there's, there's, there's been a societal shift in my mind in the last couple of years where people are way more focused on this with a sense of urgency that I haven't seen before. because. It is difficult, and we need these partnerships. So I am excited about the partnerships. So this is in, this is really getting us excited about um, increasing our investment in this area, and it's uh, it's something that's going to have a big impact, I think, uh, for, for patients around the world. And it's exciting for our employees. Our employees really like this. 
uh, and it's it's part of our our, sure. our culture. Yeah. Okay. You know, one of the things you said uh, you referenced what you and the company have learned over the last you know several years disparities in that particular example. But uh, I think one of the questions, one of the themes from several of these questions is again, if you think about the last eighteen months in the pandemic, um, both what we've learned from the Medtronic vantage point. Uh, but then also perhaps more for you as the leader of this company, what you've learned as well over these last 18 months, either about the company, the market, healthcare. How would you frame some of those? Well, I, I think, you know, what we've learned as a company is, is what we can do when we focus. You know, when we focus, we've got, I talked about some of the, the, the capabilities and the assets that we have. And when we focus on um, particular opportunities or problems, like, uh, uh, over a year ago when we had a huge uh, run on ventilators. And not only do, do we need more ventilators, but we needed to increase the functionality of that ventilator. And so we, hyped, we focused on that. You know, organizational silos came down. Uh, layers in the organization melted away, and it was just a singular purpose, and we did amazing things, uh, you know, increasing the production of the ventilator by 5x, you know, increasing the functionality of it, all in a short period of time. So I, we learned as a company the value of focus and, and what we can do. You know, I think I learned individually um, the, that, that, you know, com the communicating a clear set of priorities um, and the importance of that and, and communicating in, in a way that um, aligns our stakeholders and, 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 and really energizes them and, yeah. and, and gets them excited about it. And, and the importance of that, I think sometimes we take it for granted. And so again, part of this, this branding is getting that, mm -hmm. that, that narrative out there about who we are and really putting a stake in the ground to get all of our employees, all of our stakeholders, you know, pointed in the right direction and excited about it. Yeah, yeah. You know, you mentioned stakeholders, which is a fascinating um, conversation to be had around changing expectations stakeholders have of business, of companies like Medtronic, um, to not just build great products, to do great things with their technology, but also to, to lean in more significantly to some of these societal challenges we're talking about, access, disparities in healthcare, those kinds of things. But, and you also mentioned mission which is obviously, even in my nine months, something that's become even more clear as a foundational part of both the culture and the go-to-market plans. But the question is, if you think about how important it is to build trust, to maintain trust with our patients, the clinicians, uh, the people who we interact with on a, any given day, I mean, what in your mind are the most significant opportunities we have to continue to build trust, maintain trust, protect the trust that people are placing right. in Medtronic? You know, well, well you, you mentioned our mission, which is, you know, it's, it's our purpose. It's our, you know, a lot of companies call it purpose. You know, we, you know, you can, uh, we call it our mission written 60 years ago. And it really defines, you know, kind of our intent and what we want to do. And, and I think um, another thing, you know, going back to the last question, what did I learn during the uh, pandemic individually? I learned having a core set of principles written out like that in some detail, like our mission, six tenets, covers a wide range of topics here, you know, from patients to, to ethics to, you know, uh, to, you know, communities and employees, how important that is to, as, as a framework for making decisions. Okay, so that's, you know, that is critical. But I think as we, if you, you talked about trust, intent is not enough. Because I, I, I do think a lot of companies now that maybe did not have a mission written down, have gone back and started to do that, is write down their core beliefs and clarify those core beliefs, prioritize those core beliefs, and write them down like look, we've had. But intent is not enough. That intent to build trust has to be matched with actions, right? They got to see what your people are, where you're spending your time, not just your words, where you're spending your time, you know, where you're investing your resources, right? So that's, that's the, uh, and, then, and then ultimately impact. Uh, you know, do, do those actions, intent, actions, do they, do you, you get the desired effect. And you have to do that consistently. You know, I find that, you know, if we do it, you know, you know, 99 out of 100 days, but that one day or that one instance that you fall down, that breaks down trust. Uh, people remember that negative. And, and um, so I, I think to build trust, you, you really can't, you've got to be 100 out of 100 in, instances, intent, action, impact. Right. Fascinating. Okay, one of the other themes across a couple of these questions, and you mentioned this in your last one in relation to mission, was the importance of people. You talked a little bit about employees and the Medtronic employees and just the remarkable work that they have done over the last 18 months or so. But uh, more broadly, as there's a question around how do people and talent 
or the desire to make Medtronic a talent destination play into both this bold ambition and the way you think about the power or impact of a strong brand that we're trying to build here? Well, look, I think you talked about societal shifts. I think uh, one of the societal shifts that had been occurring prior to the pandemic and the pandemic accelerated that is that, you know, people of all ages, a lot of times this is, people say it's the, a new generation, but I'm thinking all, no matter where you are in your, in your stage of life you're in, people more and more want to work for a company that aligns with, with their values. So it's no longer just about, you know, a company with a good reputation and, and career advancement opportunities. It's about that plus and, and, and emphasized on aligning with your, your core values. And, and people want to work for companies that stand for something. So, um, you know, we've, we've talked about our mission, and I think backing that mission up with actions and, and impact is a, uh, a great way to attract these people. And given that we're a, uh, the best people, and given that um, we're a technology company, and like I said, technology is a people-driven business, innovation is a people-driven business, uh, we need to attract those best people. And this, uh, this is one way we're, this is a key way we're attracting the, the, and retaining that talent. Sure. Okay. Another question, um, and you mentioned B20 and the G20 as well, but around perhaps some examples of global initiatives or partnerships focused on health equity or underserved communities that are exciting to you in terms of their possibilities. Well, like I said, uh, first of all, a lot of the, uh, when we go talk to um, global health and uh, provider partners and uh, we hear a lot about um, hypertension, heart failure, diabetes. You know, we have uh, opportunities in all these areas. We have products in all these areas, therapies in all these areas. And, and um, what I'm excited about is, is some of the partnerships we're forming. Some are forming like new with, with hospitals in the U.S., but, you know, where we've got actually a little bit more traction is outside the U.S. Right. With governments uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, other companies, pharma companies, because a lot of these solutions, first of all, you know, having a high quality healthcare um, uh, solution in a low resource environment is tough. It takes partnerships. And so we're partnering with different governments, like I said, Sub Saharan Africa, different uh, uh, companies like pharma, because some of our devices are, 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 are part of a therapy solution that does involve mm -hmm. uh, a, a drug of some sort, like, a, like insulin in our diabetes business. And these partnerships are exciting, because not only you know, are they contributing to some of the funding that's needed, but more importantly, the ideas and the, and the capabilities. And their technologies combined with ours in a very fo you know, focused way around some of these chronic diseases, we are really making some exciting progress. Sure, okay. Another question uh, coming in here from Philippe, um, and he says, Medtronic brings innovations to patients and physicians, but how can you facilitate, accelerate those innovations reaching consumers or patients in terms of speed to market and some of the things they know that are, are priorities for you as well? Well, there's a couple elements to that question. I mean, one, you know, speed to market is, is big, and we've done a, over the last year, we've reorganized our company, really decentralizing um, the company into from like these three large groups into 20 smaller, more agile businesses that are closer to the customer, closer to uh, the conditions that they serve, closer to the patients, so that they can move, you know, faster. And we've given them more empowerment. So we're, you know, we're still in the early innings of this, but I'm convinced that this is going to speed up our time to market. Um, the other piece to that that you, you mentioned direct to the consumer, um, I think uh, us uh, building out that that direct to consumer muscle. That's not something that we've done a lot of in the past, but as uh, our technologies uh, are improving, they're moving up in the care continuum uh, ahead of what, you know, uh, in many cases, uh, pharma. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got to get that message out. So we've got to drive that awareness at the patient level uh, and even at the primary care level. And so, you know, our traditional go-to-market uh, uh, through specialized sales forces doesn't lend itself to that. So we are building a direct-to-consumer muscle, and, and, and as you know, we're, sure. people are going to see more of that. Yes, yeah, okay. So to that, that's a great point, great segue in terms of the customer story that we saw, Arlene, if you remember, at the right. beginning of this, um, I think is a great example of increasingly what we are seeing, which is consumers getting more involved in right. um, advocating for their care and um, in some ways having a much more significant voice. Uh, in decisions that are being made. 
But how do you think about how healthcare is becoming more personal to people in that way and how consumers are having a much more influential role in some of these decisions? Well, uh, you, you touched on it. I mean, consumers are getting much more. I mean, information has been disseminated out there and, you know, due to the Internet and things. Uh, you know, patients are getting much more involved in their care. Uh, their loved ones are getting much more involved and educated. And um, they're going into their physicians asking about certain things. Heck, I, I get calls, uh, you know, from, from people that somehow get my, you know, contact information or through friends and, and they say, hey, I read about this, I read about that. And it's, it's they get, they always, usually they have part of the story. Uh, so this gets back to why we're so excited about getting more into uh, direct to consumer to drive an, a, a level of awareness uh, and then help steer these, you know, these consumers to the right healthcare professional or to the right information so they get the full story uh, and, and open their eyes, drive that awareness to what's, what's, out, what's possible. Right. Okay. Another question along the lines of that same one in terms of things that we've seen, trends in the healthcare market over the last 18 months around the pandemic is telehealth. Right. And in particular, remote yet connected care has gained greater acceptance during the pandemic. What is Medtronic doing, or what's your point of view on the telehealth opportunity, given the shifts that the pandemic well, has driven? This is another big one. Uh, and in a lot of cases, we've had this technology in place, and, and the adoption was slow. But the pandemic forced a much higher degree of adoption, and we're seeing three areas. I'd say, you know, one uh, area is, uh, you know, people don't think about this, but remote training of physicians. We talked about training earlier. Education of physicians around you know what's new and how to how to apply this technology into their practices into the care pathways. A lot of this in, historically is done face to face. We're doing much more of this remotely now with great technology. And it's not like they're they're missing something because we use you know augmented reality, virtual reality, simulation technology. Uh, again, this is a great way to to educate and train physicians. The second is remote patient management. Mm -hmm. So historically, patients uh, that would have to come into a physician's office. In so many, for so many reason, instances, they don't have to do that anymore. Right. And uh, I, I still remember, um, you know, during the pandemic, uh, after an earnings call, a reporter talking to me about how his wife was petrified about going into the hospital to get to get her pacemaker checked. And now, because of remote technology, she didn't have to do that. And so that's a big one. And, and, and also the final piece is remote uh, device management. Now, we don't have to send people into the hospital to, to make programming adjustments or uh, uh, repair equipment. This can be done in many ways uh, remotely. So those three things uh, are, are big changes that are driving efficiencies, not just for, for, for Medtronic, but for physicians and patients and, 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 and lowering costs in the healthcare system overall. Sure. Okay. And this is here to stay. I, 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 we're not turning back. Right. Fascinating. One, one other point, a uh, theme that we picked up on, again, you talked about going beyond devices and talked a little bit about some of the innovations coming down the pipeline here at Medtronic. But if you think about perhaps markets around the world, and you're starting to travel a good bit more now, are there places where you're seeing some interesting things that pertain to healthcare and the opportunity or consumer behaviors or anything that you'd call out as things that are interesting to you? Well, I think some of the trends we talked about are, are truly global, like consumers getting more engaged. Um, you know, I do see in certain countries healthcare innovation ecosystems uh, being developed where there, where there weren't any before. I mean, China's a great example of this. Uh, you know, there is a lot of innovation going on in China, and there is also a developing a healthy you know, venture capital um, you know, capability there. So they've got real innovation capability. They've got now um, you know, ready access to, to funding, and, and they've got government support. So I see a Chinese healthcare ecosystem uh, you know, growing, mm -hmm. and, and I think you're going to start to see some, you know, you know, Chinese competitors starting to come out of China, not just serve the Chinese population. Sure. You know, one of the other things that you mentioned a couple questions back was, again, the impact that data, algorithms, AI are going to increasingly have, even beyond what we're seeing today on healthcare. How, how do you think about that, both specific to Medtronic, but perhaps also in terms of some of the things like access and cost that we've already talked about? Um, because this is a new area that I think, again, the pandemic has changed, consumer comfort, willingness to, to see the value benefit of data. But what is your thought? Well, look, because of um, devices are connected, 
you know, because of improved computational, you know, computational power, cloud, I mean, there's a lot more data out there. And we can do a lot more things with that data. And, and I, I have, we, we're seeing great examples of where the use, the appropriate use of this data combined with machine learning and AI is, 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 is really a profound, is driving a profound impact on healthcare in every way. So reducing costs, improving access, and improving outcomes at the same time. And I would argue, as I've been you know, talking to our technical community here at Medtronic, you know, the broad-based technical community, uh, including you know, all the engineers and scientists, and, and coming to the conclusion that the rate limiter, if you will, the cap on our innovation will be defined not by money, not by you know, traditional mechanical or electrical or chemical questions, but by data. Mm -hmm. The more data uh, that we um, can use, again, use appropriately, we're talking about using it for um, better outcomes uh, and you know, clinical outcomes and safety and just innovation of that next generation of therapy, uh, respecting people's privacy, uh, using it appropriately, it is exponentially uh, improving um, our ability to hit all these three goals, which, you know, historically many looked at as conflicting. The idea of improving a clinical outcome, improving access to these outcomes, and lowering costs at the same time, people thought as conflicting. You had to make trade-offs. The, the, the changes in technology really, and, and a big one uh, powered by uh, data, is breaking that paradigm. Sure. You know, one of the other things that you've mentioned a couple times already is, you know, this brand positioning around engineering the extraordinary, right. um, both for its appeal to thinking about Medtronic as a talent destination, as a technology company that's doing some innovative things, you know, focused on the healthcare marketplace. But when you think about that brand positioning and if you were whiteboarding the desired view you'd like for external stakeholders to have about us as a company, or what you'd ideally like to have them understand about Medtronic. I mean, what, what would those things be in your mind? You know, I, I think that we're using, uh, that one, we've got a lot of engineering capability. We've got that technical capability, and we're using it to, to redefine the art of the possible here in healthcare, and um, that, that we're a leader here. I mean, that, that's really, I mean, there's broader, you know, there's broader implications, but if I had to really focus it on engineering the extraordinary, is I want people to, to think of Medtronic as, you know, we're using technology to redefine what is possible in healthcare it, it, on all levels, you know, you know uh, not just in the U.S., you know, but around the world, uh, you know, in all corners. Sure. So given that construct, and, and we had a question earlier about, you know, Google and Amazon and others, I mean, who are the competitors for this you know, market that we're talking about, again, beyond med tech into this broader healthcare and technology arena, or how do you think about competitors? You, know, you mentioned earlier competitors versus partners, and many people will be both, but if you think about that view that we need to be benchmarking ourselves against, or at least being mindful of, uh, who, who comes to mind for you in that? Well, you know, you, there's a couple things there, benchmarking, uh, and then flat out competing against. I mean, the speed, of, uh, of certain uh, the tech companies are a good benchmark for us. And the impact, how ubiquitous uh, some of these technologies are. You know, we all have cell phones, right? We all use the internet. I mean, Google's like a verb, right? I mean, it's, it's, I mean that's ubiquitous. They've had profound impact and um, in all you know, parts of society. So I think benchmarking on the speed in which they do things, the scale in which they do things is a great benchmark because that's what healthcare needs. And, um, you know, but one thing I'm sure when it comes to direct competition, I don't know if there'll be direct competitors, I, you know, because uh, what we do is, is can be, you know, pretty complicated and, and not that they're not uh, capable of, you know, um, doing complex things, but healthcare, you know, uh, treating people, Putting little computers inside people's body. This is a this is a, an acquired skill that takes years, and um, I know for sure that we're going to use this technology to do what we've done historically, faster, and on a much broader scale. Sure. Okay. 
Fascinating. Um, when you think about the next three to five years for Medtronic and for the healthcare marketplace at large, and if you were putting yourself three years out, I mean, what are the things that you would b hope to be able to say, we've proven that there's power impact, you know, in these areas? Again, you mentioned the not to, you know, give an answer right. there, but, you know, robotics or other right. areas. So, look, three to five years out, I, I, some of the, the things that we're launching now, like robotics, hopefully soon uh, renal, something that we call renal denervation, which is really a, this, this breakthrough hyper, uh, hypertension therapy, that these are changing the game on all three of the vectors we talked about, improving outcomes, improving access, uh, reducing costs. You know, we can throw our, our pill cam genius. That's the device we talked about for, you know, that's going to redefine colonoscopies. We have this beautiful pipeline that we're talking about, and these products are just coming out, that they are having that impact across all three of those vectors. Okay, and at the same time, we're talking about new innovative therapies that we, we, we can't even thought about right now three years from now that not only have we thought about them, but they're in our pipeline. And so we've refilled that pipeline for even greater impact. Because this isn't a, a one-time shot here of a couple of great therapies and we're done. We've got to refill that pipeline and keep moving. And that's why we've had this year is the, the largest increase in the company's history in terms of R&D dollars. Uh, we're doing more acquisitions, which our acquisitions tend to be basically an extension of our R&D. So we've got to keep filling that pipeline. And then that, that trust that you talked about, more and more people you know, know about Medtronic, feel Medtronic on a daily basis, and, and, and trust Medtronic. Right, right. All right, I think we're going to uh, need to wrap up here. But I do want to make a couple points that I think, for me, have resonated in this discussion. I think clearly there's a lot going on at Medtronic. Um, what's clear is that the opportunity to think about this brand reposition, brand pivot, uh, is timed pretty closely to when it all is going to have the most impact, most value, given the things that are happening in the marketplace. But also the innovation that you talked about, and, and I think that's quite clear in terms of not just the pipeline, but some things that are dramatically going to change the trajectory of some of the more challenging aspects of healthcare access, disparities, those kinds of things. And so it's very exciting. And so I want to thank you again, Jeff, for spending the time with us today. I want to thank the audience for uh, checking in with us on, again, our bold ambition to learn more. I encourage you to check out Medtronic.com. We also, you know, today released our most recent uh, ESG report. And so you'll find some interesting data there. Jeff touched on a lot of this, but much more detail uh, on the website as well. So again, thank you all for the time. Thank you for investing uh, in us in terms of the energy, the questions, the commentary. And again, thanks, Jeff, for spending the time with us as well. So have a great day. Yeah. Thank you.